I'm Ryan Grove. This is my wife, Tiffany Grove. We've been having a conversation about the flat earth. I believe the earth is flat. And she, like any sane person, does not believe that. And this has been a most colorful conversation, at least on my part. And it's been a very colorful debate, at least on her end. So... No more wasting time. Uh, let's talk about stars. Have you ever looked at a star through a telescope before? No, I haven't. Never? No, I haven't had the Not in school? Or you that. never had a science teacher say, no. hey, look at... Hmm. No. Well, if you ever have looked at a star through a telescope, maybe you've had the same kind of experience that um, I've had. And whenever I looked at a star through a telescope and zoomed in, it's always seemed like this undulating, amorphous, vaguely round. I mean, it's more round than square in its, in its, in its basic shape. But still, it's this thing that does like this with light pulsing. And, I, and uh, that's what we, I assume we all understand is twinkling, like the twinkling of stars. When they're twinkling, we perceive that as well. But when we look at pictures of stars given to us by like NASA and um, astronomy books and stuff, it's like that ball of gas and it's given off light, and, but it still has that, that defined shape. And I've never experientially made the, or ever found a connect between those two images. And I think that that's really very interesting. And uh, then I, I discovered something about uh, sonoluminescence, which is um, this phenomenon. And, and there's a, I mean, you can watch videos about it, or you can find it on Google. Um, it's, it's where they have, uh, scientists have taken a fluid, like a, a pretty viscous fluid, I imagine, and they've trapped a bubble, an, an air bubble, in the middle of this fluid in a jar. And they've sent a bombardment of sound waves through the jar and through the bubble. And what they found is uh, what, what they call star in a jar. It's where suddenly this little bubble starts giving off light. And so, uh, according to what the scientists have found, that I uh, take credibility in based on faith alone, because I've never done these experiments. I'd just like to go back to that, that it is a... It's a um, it's a faith-based understanding of my reality since I'm not out there doing the experience, uh, experiments myself. So anyway, they, they put the, 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 the bombardment of sound waves through the bubble. And what they found was that the bubble, the molecules inside the bubble would become so agitated and they would expand so rapidly because of the sound waves that, um, that they would just as fast uh, collapse. And when they collapsed, it uh, was such a, they gave off such a tremendous release of energy that it caused heat and light. And as they continued to put the sound waves through the bubble in this sonoluminescent experiment, um, they, they saw that this was happening over and over and over again in right. rapid succession. Because giving, uh, or increasing the heat gives off different electromagnetic radiation. And, and one of the scientists said, hey, well, that's just like what's happening in the sun. It's uh, the density in the middle. I mean, there's such a, a force of density and, and, and um, or whatever. It was enough force at the core to actually cause fusion, a fusion reaction. And thus, the fusion reaction is, is supposedly the, the, the engine or the furnace that keeps the sun burning yeah, constantly, that's how the sun right, works. right. And uh, but the scientists, interestingly enough, also were reminded when they saw the blue light doing this, they were reminded of stars as well. And when, if you could see a video of the two, you would think that they were remarkably similar phenomenon. And so I'm just posturing myself for a possible argument in our conversation that 
perhaps that's what stars really are. And this is going to go off the deep end now, but you know, in the Bible, when the flood happened, it was waters below and the waters above, like the portals of the firmament opened up and water and filled up this, filled up the, the world and drowned everything. So if, in fact, there, there's some sort of fluid or water up there, then perhaps this is the very same phenomenon which causes the, the existence of stars in our sky. But like I said, that's a far stretch. I can't prove it. I just thought it was a really interesting idea to bring up. Your turn. Okay, well, um, I guess I would mention yesterday you asked me a question about who the director of the movie Dogtooth was. So that was Yorgos Lanthimos. And he's, yes, he is Greek. And he also directed the movie Lobster and the Killing of the Sacred Deer. Lanthimos, okay, thank you. Yeah. So that was that. And um, in regard to what you're saying about the stars, um, I would point out that all matter is merely energy compressed to slow vibration. I don't know uh, if that helps in your, well, it's whatever good. you're thinking. Certainly important to know. <laughs> I don't disagree with that. Um, okay, so maybe you talk about a little bit about gravity and electromagnetics. Again? I don't think we talked about gravity at all. Um, w w why don't we talk about um, why the sky is blue? And you, you already know this because I've asked you this and explained this to you before. But no. Well, why is the sky blue? Um, I guess because of the different gases. I know you think it's because of the argon. All right, like I just said, you already know. But I'm, I'm actually... It's like 9% of the posing, atmosphere. Posing the question to... To the people out there because when I ask people in real life why is the sky blue everyone says they don't know and if they're forced to guess they all come up with the same guess well it reflects the blue of the water of the oceans or whatever and when they say that I think that some teacher or somebody in authority while I was being raised suggested to me incidentally that that might be the same thing but, but, you know, that doesn't make sense for a lot of reasons. Um, like, for example, if you go to, like, the Gobi Desert or you, you go to the, the steppes of Russia where there's just thousands of miles of land, then you would expect, if that were the case, the sky to probably be brown. And another thing is that if you pour a glass of water and you look at it, it certainly doesn't look blue. It's clear. So I wonder how many glasses of water it would take, how many gallons or whatever, for what does it take for water to actually turn blue? Mm -hmm. And my whole point is that water isn't blue. I mean, it can be uh, discolored because of like uh, like like stuff it, stuff in it, like pollutants or minerals and all that stuff. But it's just generally not blue. And and then I heard a theory that the reason water looks blue, like ocean water or large bodies of water, is because it's, it's reflecting the sky. And the same theory also suggests that there's actually two kinds of daylight during the day. There's the, the sun, which is a, a lamp, more or less for the sake of this conversation, and it provides direct sunlight and it causes the shadows that we see, and, you know, it's orange, whatever. But behind that, there's the sky itself is also a light and it's radiating blue. And the reason for this is because if you go, um, let's see, the, uh, the ozone layer is like 12 to 16 miles up, somewhere in there. And once you get above the ozone layer, then you get this, this, this um, layer of sub-layers of all the noble gases. And of course, they layer themselves according to their atomic weight. So I, I, if I understand this correctly, argon is the densest and when you get above the ozone layer you find a, a dense layer of argon and something interesting about the noble gases is that neon is not just the only noble gas that lights up from what i understand if you empty the neon sign out of its neon and you put argon into it and then you put electrical current through it that it would begin to glow as well yeah. and i saw some 
um, does, scientists that's do that. True. And and when they did that, according to the intensity of of the current that they were putting through the argon, mm -hmm. it at at its peak it turned this bright, beautiful daylight blue. Mm -hmm. And as they decreased, um, it began to fade into pinks and oranges, like we see with sunsets and mornings. Right. And I thought that was pretty extraordinary. So there's kind of like a neon light, but it's argon yeah. that is daylight. Because technically, a neon light emits only red rays. So if you see a neon light, it's not necessarily a neon. Yeah, it's light. perhaps another noble gas. Or painted glass. Or painted with glass. With the red underneath. <laughs> so, however, what's interesting, and, and, and if that's true, why is, is that not like loosely explained in schools? Why is that totally removed? I think from it is everyone's... loosely explained. No, no, no one I've ever met in person, and I've asked a lot of people, have ever heard anything like this before, well, and I because hadn't of the either. Lack of education, like I was saying. I mean, everybody. Knows what I'm saying that is that that should be like a. If, if, if they teach you that you're on a globe and there's gravity when you're in kindergarten, when you're in kindergarten, they should teach you that the reason yeah. the sky is blue, because that's one of the fundamental questions of philosophical questions that kids have when they're little. Why is the sky blue, mom? You know, mm -hmm. you know. Now that's interesting because actually I was listening to National Public Radio. And they were doing a show about the color blue, and they no noted that throughout history, the term blue is a color that was never used. So, for example, in Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, even though Homer's journey is across a vast sea, uh, they never one time mentioned the word blue. You know, there's greens and all kinds of other shades, but like ochre... Stuff like that, but they never ever use the word blue. Why? Why is that? And I actually what, what was the, their conclusion? Nobody could be quite sure, but what they kind of came down to was that um, in an artistic culture, uh, blue was a really hard color of paint to get. Not only because very few plants produce a true blue pigment in their berries or flowers, but also it had a lot to do with the war. Surprisingly, like war. the place, um, I'm not sure which war, maybe World War One, maybe even before that, I don't know, but they, they couldn't transport the specific dye from these villages where they got it because of whatever war was taking place. And so, time. and therefore what? So the, the blue was just not a color that people had for their art palettes. Like and during World War One. Well, I don't know what when the war was. Are you but talking about like like the like? I don't. I said I don't know when the war. Well, I'm was. asking you if how you're thinking about this is um, like, you said Greek, you made that reference. So uh, what you're saying is that throughout history, there have been all these impediments to people getting the the color blue from dyes and stuff like that. Yeah. And so it was just sort of ignored. And so what I'm asking you is that then like, so what does that mean? So it's just interesting, and then so this guy did this study. This this guy with his daughter, he's like, "Hey, you know, honey." Sounds like you're getting mad at me for a minute. Just putting that out there. Because uh, I said I didn't know which war. Why do you keep grilling me about that same question? Right, I won't grill you anymore. Continue. I want to hear about this experiment. Huh? Uh, it was just a jumble of facts that are in my brain. I I don't know what war, Ryan, but uh, he pointed out that he took the time to ask his daughter every day after he heard about this. He's like, "I'm gonna." Asked my daughter. So him and his wife agreed never to say, like, the sky is blue. And every day, or not every day, but, like, maybe once a week, he'd say, well, what color is the sky? And sometimes she would say yellow. Sometimes she would say white. Um, but it took her until she was about five years old before she would be able to say that it looked blue to her. And then it consistently didn't always look blue either. And it doesn't. Sometimes so, it's pink and but orange. And... What I was going to say about what you're talking about is um, uh, matter is going to give off different light based on what it is. So those are called emission spectrums. And so used in a chemistry classroom where you're burning or heating objects and looking at the light that comes off that, uh, You'll just see it as one color of light, so you'll have to use a prism or a diffraction grating 
to spread it apart so that we can see the colors of the light that are found there, but it's almost a fingerprint of what the atom is, their emission spectrum, and we can look at light and break it down into different wavelengths and say, oh, this is, you know, whatever, iron, hydrogen. And um, as far as like the sky goes, then yeah, we have the refraction and um, every time that the light has to p pass through a different type of atmospheric layer, you're going to get a different color. So if our gun's at the bottom, then, you know, I guess maybe that's why the blue comes off so clearly. But I don't think it's always clear that the sky is blue. Because it's not always blue, but, yeah. for the, but for the very reasons that you just outlined just now. Differences in the conditions so what does of the atmosphere. That have to do with the Earth? Well, I, what I think is interesting is that, from what I understand of this model, is that in order for that layer <clears throat> to be lit up so brilliantly, um, all the the argon molecules are rocking, rocking around and getting agitated and giving all this, giving off the light and the, and the energy that I, I believe it does is that it requires a, a a localized and focused because of the localization uh electromagnetic energy source and i uh, i think that the sun which is not 90 million miles away in my world view is actually very cl close like maybe 3000 miles away or so and that that as it passes around um the the plain earth Mm -hmm. that it excites because of its electromagnetic emissions all of the argon molecules so it, it gives off its own light and it also excites the argon molecules and it creates the blue neon-y light that we consider daylight as long as um, the, the atmosphere is clear and there's not clouds and there's not haze or there's not smog or whatever and that it's doing this constantly and then as it retreats to the other side of the plane from one's perspective that that agitation of the argon begins to calm down and then and then when when it's still again then you can see through it because it's not giving off any light and so at night time when this happens then you can see through that layer you can see through all the layers and, or at least as far as you know you can see stars and what things, does this have things to like do that. with the earth being flat though well that means the sun would have to be localized no it doesn't well it does in 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 uh in the way that I was, in the way that I understood the information when well, I initially I, got it to I begin with. I would need with. to know why you think that. I don't. Well, I would need that. to know why you think it doesn't so quickly. What do you well, mean? Well, why, why doesn't it necessitate that it's a localized electromagnetic source? It just doesn't. What? What do you mean? Well, you just asked me why it does it. I mean, you know what the power it, well, I'm asking... is, right? Because it works on nuclear fission or fusion. You know what the how. Well, yeah, I, I just referenced that quality yeah. to be understood in the heliocentric model of the universe already so what's a little that bit earlier. Has, uh, right. so I'm well, saying, I'm just back is, at you, Ian, because be? you said, you know, why, why am I saying why not? I mean, because you know. said it, you uh, said I'll, it so. I'll look it up and yeah, I'll yeah, come back to you. Yeah, yeah, some something stuff, to be some considered in research okay. for sure, I think so. And then last time, uh, speaking of atmosphere and light then, you said something about what about corpuscular rays. So what are corpuscular rays just like if you see a photo of us look it up you can go on google and you can look up sun on top of I clouds i did look it up and it's called crepuscular rays crepuscular rays it's crepuscular c-r-e-p-u-s-c -E -E. so it's not corpuscles crepuscular rays this isn't a trial yeah i'm just saying we don't need to so what to do bust you each think, other on, on, on those do you think crepuscular mistakes. rays That's why I like, because you know, it's the ideas that we're trying to share that, yeah. that are ultimately what's important here. So I just want you to tell me what you think crepuscular <clears throat> rays indicate. Uh, that when you look at a cloud and the sun is overhead and the sunlight comes through the cloud, it comes through in non-parallel uh, beams where like a fan and we all know what sun coming through the clouds looks like it fans mm -hmm. out sure. but if the sun was 90 some you know million miles away 
and the, it is so huge and the Earth is so small, you would imagine that all rays coming into the planet would all be parallel to one another, coming from the same direction. But if you imagine the sun being localized and above you, then you could see how, from the perspective of someone significantly closer to the light source, you could see how you know the rays would fan out. So crepuscular Cre rays. Crepuscularly. Yeah. They happen when the sun ha has set behind an irregular shaped cloud or mountain, which lets the rays of the sun pass yeah, through it. Yeah, that's, that's another example of the bands. fanning out. Yeah. Right. So it's just the atmospheric. Yeah, but you can also see it when it's overhead. Right. Not just when it's like right, but setting. They, they get the term from actually the ter a, a Greek term that has to do with twilight. So that's why they, because that's where you most often see it. It's spanning up from the horizon. But yes, yeah, spanning so you can up from the horizon during the day. I, I don't even know how that makes any sense. Uh, what do you mean it's spanning up from the horizon? What because is? Because the What's sun has almost set, but you can still see. <coughs> no, I told you, you, you can get that in, in at midday. You can get that. No, at I know. Any time I'm just day. saying the term comes from twilight, though, so it's most commonly seen then and known for that. But yes, you can always have also have that sort of refraction and um, oh, when is, you have a cloud in the sky during the day. This is a lot arguier than usual. Yeah, it's bad five. Okay. Um, maybe you should start off with something. I don't have anything. I mean, I have plenty, but... Yeah, plenty. Give us something. Well, you just want me to just start rambling off, read all my notes for you? No, I want you to talk about it or continue the conversation. Since, you know, dead time sucks. Well, why do you think you don't need the force of gravity? Because electromagnetics satisfies all that... All of the... If electromagnetics satisfied all the the requirements to understand how this Earth functions, then there wouldn't be any discrepancies in the equations when they tried to work them out. There wouldn't be any what? There wouldn't be discrepancies in the equations mm, when they tried to work them out. And people have tried. Albert Einstein wanted uh, the universal field theory. He didn't like the four forces of uh, the universe... Because Not they were mathematically to... inexpressible, and that is that what you were saying? No, he felt that 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 there was one universal field equation that could take in all the four forces of the universe. So yes, he's so trying. So they to, were trying to unify to, them mathematically. Yeah. Yes. Well, because what if I posture this? Postulate this. If man cannot yet mathematically find an expression for a phenomenon, do we have to keep changing the phenomenon or our reality in a way to conform with mathematics? Or might we be more prudent to assume that maybe we just mathematically don't understand the phenomenon yet? I don't know, something to think about. Something to think about for well, sure. Well, we definitely don't uh, have... 100% knowledge. That's well, sure. I'm glad sure. we got that out on the yeah. table because that's good to know. Yeah. And that's true. That's why we keep reworking the equations. So these ideas are not set in stone. Yeah, but, but the mathematics doesn't necessarily change. It's it's the, the, the way that we perceive reality that they keep changing to accommodate some sort of mathematical... And that seems like... How silliness. are they changing reality? Well, you could have Einstein and then you yeah. could have Borg and you could have Newton... And they're all changing the nature of reality to fit their mathematics. It seems to me a little bit more so than they're using mathematics to truthfully explain reality. No, they're uh, they're making observations and then trying to uh, make equations okay, to what, express the observations. What observations well, does Einstein use? Everything he says is all based and sourced in mathematics. Well, I, I, I can't imagine he's a naturalist and he was out there in the world... Hmm, looking at phenomenon and trying to reconcile it. No, he's looking at phenomena and he's trying to He's looking at philosophies and trying to mathematically, and hypotheses and trying to mathematically come up with justifications for that. Just like Newton was doing originally to come up with uh, his his law of gravity or whatever. Mm -hmm. I, anyway, I'm not saying I'm right or wrong. Like, we shouldn't even be having these technical talks with any sort of sense of authority because neither one of us are technicians, like I keep saying over and over again. We're just lay people. But for lay people, that's something to consider, I think. And it's, 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 it's pertinent 
at some level, <clears throat> whether face value or something deeper. But I will let you talk. I don't want to seem like a big conversation hog. I don't if really I have cock, anything to I say. I would give it to you. It's well, you have all these if, notes. What if are, you want to bring up gravity sometime and refute it, then go ahead. I'd love to hear it. Well, maybe because I will. Because there's so many maybe mathematicians that have been trying so hard to, to unify the fields. So if you to, can do it, I'd like to do maybe, it. Maybe. I'd really like to hear it. Maybe the, the, the two paradigms are incompatible. I think I'm just done for today. You know what? I respect that. And Good. I love you. And we'll be back.